The title is, it's a little bit turned in your bulletins. It's actually, God is good, so what? And um, we're, we're going to have that concept for a few weeks. God is fill in the blank, so what? But I want to um, start out today by reading two little pieces of scripture. Well, one is little and the other one's a bit bigger. Psalm 136 says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And if you have Psalm 136 or you open it to that, you'll see that there's always a congregational response. His love endures forever. And so as they go through all these attributes and all the actions of God, his love endures forever. So there's, there's an eternal sense uh, to that, that love of God that we experience in our lives, even though we always don't feel it in exactly that same way. So, and, and Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul's writings, we're going to read from Romans today, and we remember that the Roman church, uh, Paul is just trying to, trying to get them on board, so to speak. It's like he's giving them some, uh, some rules or practices that will help them uh, develop their faith life and to become uh, the people individually and communally that um, God wants them to be. I'm reading out of something called The Message, which is a transliteration uh, of, of uh, Hebrew Scripture and Greek Scripture by uh, Eugene Peterson. It's been around now for about 20 years or so. But I think sometimes the language allows us to think differently to the message. Many of us are pretty familiar with Roman 12, or uh, we've probably heard parts of it um, used in sermon uh, at various times, but just sit and listen uh, with an open mind, uh, no preconceptions about what Paul is trying to lead us to. So here's how this transliteration reads. So here's what I want you to do uh, with God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for God. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Paul continues, I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you do not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God is bringing goodness to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God does and what God does for us, not by who we are and what we do for God. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning as a whole, not the other way around. Since we find ourselves fashioned into all that is excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts of Christ's body, let's go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. And then Paul goes through that litany. Uh, if, if you preach, just preach God's message. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you're a leader, be a leader, but not a manipulator. He goes through that whole litany. And he finishes it with, by saying, keep a smile on your face. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. And here's the one that a lot of us have trouble with. Practice playing second fiddle. So this transliteration is very easy to get our heads around, isn't it? That, but then he cautions as well. Don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled and aflame. 
be alert servants of the Master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help those who are needy be inventive in hospitality. We're starting a, a worship series, uh, and the first one is today, God is Good, So What? And we have a short clip that will introduce that series. Can we run that now? You know, sometimes when we hear the phrase, so what, there's, there's a, a hint of sarcasm attached to it. But that's not the intention at all in this series. It's, so what is our response? So how do we take that information about one of God's attributes, and how does that change the way we live? And that's our conversation today. We're talking about God is good, and we're not talking so much about the so what in, in, a, in a sense of what difference does it make. We're not talking about, <coughs> excuse me, about why does it matter. We're talking about what is our response. Most of us have been connected in the Christian community for a number of years, but not all of us. Some of us have developed um, practices over time that um, serve us well in growing in, in understanding of how Christ is working in our lives through the Holy Spirit but not all of us. And so some of you will find in the conversation that we have over the next 20 minutes or so, um, affirmation of something you might be doing, um, uh, uh, an invitation to tweak something you might be doing, or recognizing that this is something I should add to what I am doing that I hadn't really considered doing before. I, uh, I've run out of voice for some reason at second service, so it's nothing personal, but that's, um, I'm going to have to suck on a cough drop as well. Now, we know that God has many more attributes than the four that were listed in the video, correct? Uh, but we're not going to think about that. We're not going to think about what ones are missing. Let's just enjoy the four that are going to be examined. The one today, as I mentioned, is God is good. We're also going to be doing God is loving, God is forgiving, and God is powerful and the impact that that has on our lives. One of the things we have to admit right out front is that sometimes when we think about God is good, we start coming up with a negative approach. You know, if God is so good, why are there so many negative things that happen in the world? And that is a whole other sermon series, so we can't go there. But we have to acknowledge that there might be a voice in the back of our head saying, so why do we have so much thinking about today's climate? Why do we have so much social discord? Why do we have so much political anim animosity? Why is there not a bipartisan approach to solving some of our national and global problems? Why do people still have to argue about things? Why do we experience illness and injuries? Why do we live sometimes with economic uncertainties? I just met a couple um, last Friday morning in preparation for uh, a wedding that they're planning, and both of them are unemployed, which sounds terrible, but both of them just graduated from college. So uh, they're trying, trying to take the summer to figure out who they are and where they're going to be and how their two different careers can be met in the same metropolitan area, for instance. But they both come from small towns, so they don't want to go to the metro area right away. They, they want to continue to live the way they have. So they have that tension. The jobs are here, but we'd prefer to live there. Everybody lives with a certain amount of tension. We have situations and choices that we have to make um, when 
individually, when we examine them just in the specific, it doesn't feel real good. Uh, it, it seems like there's something lacking in God's goodness in that situation. So sometimes, as we're told to do, we need to step back, you know, and in, in this case, look at our life mosaic. What's our life story as a whole? And is it good? I think most of us would agree that yes, it is. Though we've experienced bad things or made bad choices or had to live in a bad situation, all in all, life is good. Let me give you an example of how that, that focusing on the small um, bad things can have such a negative impact. Uh, just two days ago, a friend sent me um, this little story. There was a preacher who was visiting a small church and on Saturday morning, he was attending the men's breakfast, and this was in the, the agriculture area around the Piedmont foothills in North Carolina. And he asked one of the farmers there, one of the older fellows in attendance, to say grace that morning. And if you've been out in that part of the world, people are willing to pray at the drop of a hat, so that was not an unusual request at all. They don't wait for the pastor typically to even ask. They'll just say, I'll pray this time. Anyway, he asked this man, and as after everybody was seated, this older farmer says, he began with, Lord... I hate buttermilk. And that visiting preacher right away thought, what is going on here? But he didn't say anything. And then the farmer proclaimed loudly his second concern, Lord, I hate lard. Well, the visiting preacher lifted one eyebrow to see if anybody else was kind of offended by what was happening, and nobody seemed to be particularly concerned. And without missing a beat, the farmer continued his prayer. And Lord, you know, just like almost everyone else, I see no reason to be consuming raw white flour. Well, that preacher was just about ready to push himself up and stand up and put a halt to this when the guy continued. But Lord, when you mix all this together and you bake it just right, I surely do love the biscuits that you make. Make sense? Well, then he continued. He concluded the prayer with, So, Lord, when things come up in our lives that we don't like, when life gets harder than we want it to be, when we just don't seem to understand what you are saying to us, help us to just sit back and take a breath until you're done mixing and baking. And we know the end result will be something even better than this morning's biscuits that we are about to consume. Amen. <laughs> Stepping back and seeing what the end result is isn't always easy for us to do. We're a little impatient sometimes. We want to get out ahead of the game. We want to know what the last page of the book reads. But we miss an awful lot of character building if we only read the first and the last page of any book we pick up. We're in it for the long haul, moment by moment, day by day. But that doesn't, um, that doesn't mean that we don't struggle in the tension, the tension between right and wrong. As children, we grew up learning right and wrong. As, as adults, we're teaching others, perhaps our children or others, about right and wrong. But the tension remains. We think about the differences between good and evil and how sometimes it doesn't seem like we have a choice. We have a choice between two evils instead of a good and an evil. We struggle with honoring and obeying God no matter what is going on in our lives. The worst thing we can do is to turn our back on God during a time of extreme uh, pain. Instead of letting God come and love us, we turn our backs and that love has no effect on us. If we go back in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy in chapter 10, there's a conversation going on with how do, how do the, uh, the Hebrew people that have come out of this Egyptian experience, this negative experience, where uh, so much of, of what they understood it meant to be family and connected and clan, it all disappeared. They're having to rebuild. They're discovering God in a new way, and they're also recognizing that, that they need to have a community. 
that has shared values. But that community will not grow unless they create space for that growth. So the author of Deut Deuteronomy recounts how people were encouraged in, to engage in the covenant of relationship that God had invited them to accept. That also became not only the primary relationship they have with God, but the primary tool for building community. Which means they also had to recognize that in building community, you have to make space for the stranger among you, the person who isn't quite like you, the person whose speech patterns are different than yours, whose value systems may not have had the benefit of a stable um, life environment growing up. You know, a, a, a very, uh, hopefully, um, inobtrusive example is when my wife and I go to different churches, you know, we're not here every Sunday, but when we go to different churches, we experience a lot of different stuff. And one of the things that I've noticed is, is a lot of uh, younger children, five, six, seven, eight years old, um, they really don't know how to act in church for all. Not you guys, you guys are great. But they, they really don't know how to act. And the recognition is that it's not their fault. They, they were not taught how to act. And I'm not saying there's a certain way to act in church, but there's a certain way to respect what's going on. And they haven't learned that respect yet. And that's part of the building community. When you start respecting God, you start respecting all that God has created and all that God is gathering under the same tent that you're currently residing under. So that's important for us to think about. You know, Paul is talking about a certain way of living life, and way back when, the Deuteronomist was doing exactly the same thing. The circumstances were different, but the building of community, which comes from self-respect and God-respect, were exactly the same. So these biblical encouragements, it's kind of like, what is our response to the, the fact that God is good, helps us to understand that there are certain personal uh, faith practices that we can engage in. And those um, naturally get lived out in our faith communities. So there's certain communal faith practices that are important as well. And all that uh, we recognize isn't solely for our benefit, but it's for others who are trying to find their way in life, for others who have this hole in their heart that is God's shape, but they don't have any idea who God is. And we can help point out that our lives were changed, our lives were transformed, our God-shaped hole is mostly filled because we are in a transformative community and a life-changing relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds great, but even so, church leaders, whether they're lay people or, or ordained clergy, they still struggle with that tension. How do we take care of the uh, church work, the needs of the church, and do the work of the church, which is not inside these walls so much as outside these walls? How do we feed our need to know Christ more and more, while at the same time sharing that grace that we receive outside. We're in a unique situation here in that we gather here freely. There's nothing requiring us to be here. And, and yet we're also free to take all that we learn and, and take into our hearts to take it out and to do something with it. Not just to go home and say, well, the pastor made me think about something today. I'll conclude that in my morning prayers as I drive to work. But we don't do anything about it. There's no practice to that process. So that's important for us to recognize that, that this tension is always there. Let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago when I was, when I was um, still under appointment in a local church, the, I was having coffee with another clergy, and she was talking about about the identity of the church. 
And I think this shows up more so in smaller sized churches. And, you know, I used to think a small church was worshiping 100 or less, and now I think a small church is worshiping 300 or less because we have so many mega churches and we see those huge numbers. But the average United Methodist Church in Minnesota is under 100 people in worship. Uh, but most of these smaller churches, just like a small business, you you're, you're don't have a lot of staff. The smallest churches have the pastor and then a volunteer person to run the bulletin or whatever, some of those things. But anyway... My clergy friend, she was saying that, that um, this was her first appointment, and she was a little concerned because, on the one hand, this fellow had come in and said, you know, the last pastor didn't visit enough. He wasn't out, you know, out in the community. He didn't go down to the coffee shop and, and meet new people and invite them to come to church, and he didn't meet, uh, meet with our, our longtime members who are now shut-ins or homebound. You know, you got to get out there. So she took him at his word, and she, started, she changed her office hours, and she was out there uh, more often than she was in the church, in the office. Well, predictably, a couple things happened, one of them being that administrative functions started to fail, because in a small church, the pastor does about 70% of that. I'm not complaining, I'm just saying that's a reality. And the second was, about two months later, that very same man came in, and said, why can I never find you in the office? I come down to talk to you, you're never here. See, that tension of being here and being out there. And how do we, how do we, um, how do we work that out in our lives? We as individuals have that same tension. You know, if we think about it from a, a social cultural perspective, probably, our tension oftentimes is expressed with, uh, we need to get what is ours, right? Uh, we, we need to work hard. We need to get what is ours. Um, not that we're taking things that don't belong to us. What I'm saying is we work hard. We get what we want, what we need. We, we develop our creature comforts. We take care of our families. We provide for uh, whatever. But the other side of that is that's not where we're asked to be as Christians, we're asked to extend ourselves out, to not always think of ourselves first. In fact, to not think of ourselves first very often. And that's where Paul's admonition, but don't burn out over this. But the recognition is that when we only think of ourselves, when we think the gospel was for us and for nobody else, when we think our salvation is for our benefit and nobody else, we have missed the train. It has left the station and we have become a hermit in our faith, so to speak. So one of the things that we talk about, in my mind at least, is how do we break out of that shell? How do we change the way we view the, our life and the life of the church? And there's a United Methodist bishop, I think when he wrote this book, he was the bishop of the Missouri area United Methodist Conference. Uh, Robert Schnazy is his name. A household name, to be sure, right? Everybody knows Robert Schnazy. Anybody know Robert Schnazy? No? Well, uh, he wrote a very interesting book, uh, Fry, Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. Now, that kind of tells you it's a church book because nobody talks about fruitful congregations except church people, right? Because what does fruitful mean? Uh, that For a lot of us, it's hard to get our head around. So five practices of vibrant, successful forward-leaning congregations. And those five practices um, allow us, as we think about them, allow us to put into practice the internal changes that are going on in our hearts and in our minds and move them out into the external practices that we live in as a congregation and as individuals out in the world. And those five practices are this. Well, they, they're hospitality, worship, faith development, uh, mission and service, and generosity. But Schnazy, excuse me, um, Bishop Schnazy, he said, you know, that, that's too limiting. You've, you've got to pump it up. You've got to put some adjectives on it to get people's attention. And so what he changed into is radical hospitality. Now, right away you start thinking, what does that mean? Passionate worship, not just coming and sitting, but being involved. That's, uh, let me, here's a quick aside. I think we have time. You know, 
I started out talking today. If we don't have time, you'll all leave, right? That's okay. I started talking today about we're starting a new worship series. And I say worship series because I, I've never used the term sermon series. Because if it's a sermon series, it's about what I'm thinking and what I think you should be thinking about. If it's a worship series, it's part of your, you have ownership in this. You have to participate. That's part of the passion in worship is you, it's participatory. So even as you're sitting here and, and uh, you know, perhaps there's a glaze over your face for some of you, the reality is you're participating. You are forming um, interactions and responses to what's being said. You can't help it. You're participating. Unless you fell asleep, you're participating, right? It's, so this sermon is part, you are part of its formation because what I say is going to be translated by you and you're going to carry your own particular understanding of what we're talking about. You're going to carry that out the door. Hopefully you're going to think about where can I apply that in the coming weeks and months and years. Now, you'll only consciously be aware of it, perhaps, for the next day or, the, uh, or, or, or so. But something might stick in there. For me, it'll be the biscuits, because I love biscuits. So that story will stick with me for a while. And when I do, I think about how God's good works always come together in the end to make sense. Radical hospitality was the first, passionate worship, intentional faith development. You know, if, if somebody says, do you read the Bible? You go, yeah, I do. Uh, how, how much do you read it? Well, that's not important. What, what's the intentionality in that? What are you hoping to gain from it? Do you have something set up in place that you can kind of measure yourself by? Do you hold yourself accountable to other people in a small group or, or in a, a small email chain or something like that? which allows you to interact with others. That's the, the value of a study isn't that you are studying it alone, but that you're able to respond to somebody else. And in this day and age, it is so easy to set that stuff up. I still regularly correspond, even though I haven't seen some of them for many years, by email. I get a thought and I throw it out there, and people that you know I spent three years with 20 years ago, um, they'll respond back. And their, their life experience is totally different than mine, so they're coming at it from a different place. Sometimes it validates what I'm thinking, and sometimes it's, no, you're way off base on this. You have fallen off the globe, so to speak. So intentionality is very important in our faith development. We can't just let it be uh, by chance or when we happen to get around to it. Another is risk-taking, mission, and service. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. You know, we've had... We've had a, a real uptick in our mission um, engagement in the last three or four years, and that's absolutely great. So we're headed in the right direction. The last one is extravagant generosity. And if this was October or November, when we start thinking about finances of the church, that's the one I'd be talking about, extravagant generosity. <clears throat> but today, I want us to think about radical hospitality. And what was the middle song that we sang, uh, If We Are the Body? That's about no hospitality. But radical hospitality says, if we are the body, why aren't our arms reaching? Why aren't our feet going? I don't remember all the words of it. But I love that song because it challenges us. If we are truly Christians, why aren't we doing some of the things that we say we want to do? We have the ability we have the resources, and at times we even have the desire. And in those moments, that's when we got to act. That's when we got to pick up the phone and make a commitment, so to speak. So radical hospitality is something that starts in here, changes how we look at other people. We don't see the young girl that comes in as somebody that we should ridicule. We don't see the, the gentleman that comes in and is not dressed quite for church. We don't see that as an obstacle to being in a conversation and a relationship with that person. We see Christ in that person. We might not see him clearly. It might be a dim view, 
but we see Christ in that person. And so we work hard to let Christ be seen in us. That's one way to look at radical hospitality. Bishop Snazy talks uh, uh, at length about this whole process. And what he's really inviting us to do is to get active. You know, if, if I put a, a, an ad in the newspaper that says, we have worship services at 9 and 11 at Lake City United Methodist Church, that's information. That's not an invitation. You get what I mean? So if that ad is in the paper and you're sitting at the, in the lunch break room at work and somebody says, you go to church? Now is your chance to give that information and make it an invitation, right? It's up to us. We can't rely on, on media and other means of getting our message out. It really boils down to invitation one to one. I'm getting a little off track here, but, and I don't remember the exact statistic, but when there was a poll of, within about two years, I don't remember the poll name, but it was, why, uh, what's your reason for not going to church? You know what the number one reason was? You've, you've already guessed it because I just talked about it. Nobody's ever invited me. Nobody has ever invited me. Now, I'm a borderline extrovert, so I understand exactly that explanation. Because as an extrovert, I don't push my, my way into a group. There has to be a clear opening and a hand reaching out. So with something like 44% of the people say that they haven't been in church in the last six months because they haven't received an invitation. You know, I think LCUMC does a pretty good job. But I do know there's a difference between a church that says, we are the friendliest church in town, and a church that says, our hospitality is so radical, we don't even know what we're going to be doing next month. But God is going to surprise us, and we're going to be open to living into that surprise. I'm not advocating chaos, but I am advocating that we need to find new ways to let our love, the goodness that God puts in us, to let that out into the world around us. My high school principal, now I go back, goes back a long ways. My high school principal, Jake Kenyon was his name. He was a man with a lot of flaws and a lot of virtues. And he told me once when I was in trouble for some reason or another, you know how it is? He was, he was my high school principal. He was the athletic director. He was my Explorer Scout adult leader, and he was my Sunday school teacher. I couldn't get away from that guy. He knew me better than my parents did, I think. Anyway, one day he says to me, and I think it was an encouragement, you know, trying to move me away from a direction I was going. He says, you know, Jeff, as good as you think you are at something, you can always be better. So don't settle for where you are today. You know, I don't remember the context of that conversation, but I remember the statement. I may have paraphrased slightly, but I remember that statement. As good as we think we are as Christians, as good as we think we're doing as a United Methodist congregation here in Lake City, we can do better. And one way to do it is to be radical in the way we share Jesus Christ with others. Amen? Amen. Amen.